Live from Santa Monica, California, it is the show that has never, ever had to file a FOIA request, otherwise known as the Freedom of Information Act. Welcome to another episode of Moving Past Trauma Live. I have some great guests today. We have Dr. Brenna. She's a therapist. She is the host of the Real Effin' Talk podcast. And we also have Tara Newell joining us as well, who's my co-host of The Survivor Squad. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In- when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself. And it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Trauma. Mover Nation! Welcome to yet another live episode of Moving Past Trauma Live. I am your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? Happy Wednesday. This is the Wednesday wrap, as we are all becoming accustomed to. I want to say thank you so much to my channel members and subscribers for joining us today. I've got a great show for you guys, because there has been so much that has been going on in the news lately. In the last 48 hours, there has been this... Freedom of Information Act thing that has happened in the case of Gannon, uh, of Letitia Stauch and Gannon Stauch, where um, this YouTuber Zav Girl and this Natasha Cooper have released these, these images that they acquired during a FOIA request. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit later with my co-host of the Survivor Squad, Tara Newell. And... Um, we're, but we're going to discuss uh, The Idol is officially HBO's worst show ever, <laughs> worst reviewed show ever, according to Forbes. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about these Jonah Hill text messages. And we have uh, Dr. Brenna. Now, I cannot pronounce Teague, I believe is her last name, but she's going to tell us how it's pronounced. I see her laughing over there. Uh, we're going to bring her on. She uh, has been following this story really closely. She's going to share with you guys about this because there's lots of claims of gaslighting and narcissistic abuse in this particular scenario. So she's going to talk about that. So my first guest and uh, co-host of the Survivor Squad podcast, you guys all know her as the badass babe that took down Dirty John Meehan in Wondry and Netflix's series, Dirty John. Please welcome Tara Newell. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tara. How's it going? Good, good, good. And my second guest, of course, to join the conversation, this is Dr. Brenna. She is the host of The Real Effin' Podcast. You can check her out. She's joining the program as well. Please welcome Brenna. Hello, guys. It's so nice to meet you. And Tara, I'm so happy to see you. Yes, I'm so happy to see you too. We've done workshops, lives, podcasts, everything. I know. It's great. I'm so, when we were talking today, I was like, this is phenomenal. So I had to jump in. Yes, I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. So, Brenna, how do I pronounce your last name? Ty. <laughs> Ta- Ty, okay. I was like, it's Teague, Teehey, Ty. Ty. <laughs> so, it's Are you a, in- <laughs> it just get married, so that is like a new last name for me, but I do hear that people pronounce it Teague all the time, so I think I should just like get used to that. <laughs> Hi, got it. I wouldn't. I would not have guessed that. Well, thank you so much for joining the program. And your podcast is? It's called The Real Fucking Talk. I don't know if I can curse on here. Um, <laughs> not really, but it's okay. okay. Um. So yeah, Real F and Talk. Um. Yeah, I have not released an episode in about a year, just because I had a busy year. But it is mm-hmm. all about just mental health and people sharing their stories, yeah. um, vulnerabilities. So I had Tara on. It was a great episode. So, yeah. Well, I love this. This is great. This is great. So, now you guys were going through uh, a series of text messages today uh, that have you know, stored up quite a bit of controversy. And I think very apropos would be last year's word of the year, <laughs> which was gaslighting. Mm. Um, what, uh, why don't you tell us what's going on with Jonah Hill? Yes. So, and it, Tara, if you know more about this than me, I would love for you to jump in. But from my knowledge, I know that Jonah Hill had, or his ex-girlfriend, Sarah, had released like a slew of text messages between them that I believe was from when they were together. Um, so essentially these text messages, he was outlining his boundaries. Um, and I think that that is another kind of buzzword that has been throughout 
the internet throughout the last couple of years, like gaslighting, narcissist, uh, boundaries, triggers, stuff like that. So Jonah was actually misusing the term boundaries. He was really using it as like emotional manipulation under the guise of like, this is my boundary. Um, and she has been kind of exposing him and apparently she has gotten so much support from other people and so many people messaging her saying like, I've been in similar situations and I experienced this as well. So I believe that it's really brought people together. Yes. And it's also brought people apart too, because it's also like these pseudo relationships with celebrities where you support them no matter what, and you can't see them as flawed people. Mm, yeah. And I think that something that for me, and I had posted on Instagram today, and I think that's where Tara and I started connecting today was I had written that like someone who is trying to emotionally manipulate other people. It is so spot on that Jonah Hill would have that documentary that he made, I think about a year or two ago, all about mental health and how he's in therapy and the whole nine. Um, I say all the time that if someone seems super charming to you, that is such a red flag, please run. Um, anyone who is trying to come across a certain way, like Jonah Hill was trying to come across as super healthy and, you know, really self-assured and self-reflective when behind the scenes, he was clearly not any of those things. Um, it really did not rub me the right way. How did you guys feel about it? I thought the documentary was very interesting. <laughs> it was I was like, I, I don't really know how I felt about it. Now, now with these like revelations and this sort of thing, was he teeing all this up to, I mean, was this a move is essentially what I think. And I am not a conspiracy theorist at, at all, right? But was he teeing something up like this in a way to sort of manipulate his own narrative? I would definitely think so. The other part of me, of course, I am a licensed mental health counselor, so that aspect of me, it felt so unethical to have this documentary be about deep personal details of his therapist. Like as a client, it really should be all focused on him. Um, I totally get that he wanted to make some sort of documentary regarding mental health, but I think it would have been a more professional way to go about it if Stutz had said like, hey, let's focus on you and we can talk about your journey. But really going into Stutz's journey, then I have to imagine that Jonah Hill is emotionally involved in Stutz's life. And as a client, you should never be worried about your therapist. It should always be the other way around. Interesting. I see. I have a, well, Tara, what do you think? I think that it's really interesting how these text messages come out and how I think and I don't want to call him a narcissist because I don't know him fully and I'm not, you know, I'm not you, Brenna, um, to diagnose him. And to diagnose him, you also have to have him as a client, per se. But I wonder if this is the reaction of narcissist with having a therapist and then how they talk to people. Mm. If that makes sense. Totally. And I'm so happy you said that because I think that that is something like the term narcissist has been thrown around and people are so quickly labeled as narcissists. Totally. When in reality, like, yes, I am a professional and I do diagnose, but like I cannot diagnose someone who is not my client. I cannot diagnose family members and friends because I do not work with them in that sense. So I think that that's something that really should be talked about more. Like even professionals, if I am not your professional, I really cannot say for certain if you do or do not have a certain personality disorder. It's interesting you said that we we last week on Survivor Squad had uh, a two-part episode with Dr. Romney, who obviously talks a lot about narcissism. Well, all she talks about is narcissistic personality disorder. And I asked her if the if the term narcissist was overused. And she said, again, it gets kind of conflated between NPD and then, or saying someone's narcissistic, like, and it can be very overused. 
even I think about myself as a, as a creator and, and even the ethics of this, when I talk about this type of stuff a lot with my, my own father, who's a psychopath. And obviously that's a psychopathy as part of NPD. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, and he's not diagnosed. I mean, I just, he just has all the characteristics, right? I, I often wonder, am I speaking out of turn by talking about these things? Am I, am I saying things that maybe I shouldn't say, uh, too much like i i don't know i i think there might be a, a a boundary with that because there are many people on youtube that talk about this and and do not have you know three letters after their name you know, <laughs> you know what i mean so or or a, a formal education and i think when tara and i talk about this we're just basing this off our own experience in dealing with these people but what do you think that line that barrier is so i say all the time like and i do this myself where like I will always say, oh yeah, it seems like that person would meet the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, but I'm not their therapist, so I can't say that for certain. Or, you know, something that I teach a lot in psychoeducation in the therapy office and even with friends and family is like, someone can have tendencies of narcissistic personality disorder or OCD, but not have those things fully. Like there's a certain criteria that needs to be met to be defined or labeled as having a personality disorder, having OCD, whatever it is. And the only people that can really diagnose that are that individual's treatment team. So I just think it's really important to say like, you know, for you, Collier, like, yeah, my dad seems to meet the criteria for like psychopathy, but like, I'm not his doctor. So, you know, just kind of covering your bases. I don't know. Tara, do you think this is maybe a way that, uh, that people people are using this as a coping mechanism by putting people into these boxes and kind of compartmentalizing them based upon their own perceptions? Well, I think it has to do with like the ego too. Like a lot of people have ego problems, but a lot of people are not narcissists. So it's having to identify that. But if a person is able to detach to, from their ego or say, you know, take time and space and like, okay, they could see that problem later was a problem for themselves, then that's super important where, you know, it's this engaging with empathy. And I think that our receptors are kind of turned off to empathy because true crime can be so desensitized at times. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, uh, desensitization is sort of at the core and i almost wonder you know you and i tara have discussed and i'd love to get your opinion on this brenna um about uh talking so much about things in the true crime community and people um people obviously weighing in with unprofessional opinions or overstepping boundaries and we've just seen this recently where the entire true crime community has come out against these creators, uh, Natasha Cooper and Zav girl who are YouTubers apparently. And they have gone into exploiting, uh, these photos of Gannon Stouch or Stouch, uh, from the Letitia Stouch trial, the young child who lost his life. So, so brutally. And now the family is left to pick up, uh, uh, now they're starting to pick up, um, Sorry, somebody just said, hey, I'm so excited about True Crime Obsessed. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is interesting. Um, but now they've, they, they've put these photos out there and they've crossed these boundaries without thinking about the ramifications. Uh, Brenna, what do you think about situations like that when people are almost abusing power in those ways? Yeah, so I was so happy to connect with Tara today because I had actually not heard of this case and what was happening. So she sent me some links so I could just kind of read up on it. And I think that it is so appalling and so unfortunate that this is happening. And I think, you know, Tara, I think that's something you can relate to where people almost like, you know, enjoy other people's pain when I think a lot of the times we forget, like, this is actually a true story. And this person is also still alive today and still active on social media. And this person might see what I'm saying. And I think it's really, really important to back what you said, Tara, to like, lead with empathy and remember like how would i feel if someone was tweeting this about something i went through 
I'm going to give our audience just a little bit of context. I'm going to pull up a uh, a News Nation uh, video that I just grabbed, uh, which, so you guys can kind of see. This is Brian Enton talking about this. They actually released the photos to her. She had to pay. They released the photos, and she got them. Uh, and you can just imagine, based on the description of the way that little boy was killed, what those photos looked like. Zav Girl then proceeded to post them on her Patreon account, which is an account attached to her YouTube page, and she charged her followers money to see the autopsy photos. For $3, you could see little Gannon's body. Now, I mean, this, is, this is so many levels of wrong, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think, but, you know, this, I think this, unfortunately, I think this speaks to a larger sort of culture of solipsism and the look at me culture. What do you think? I would definitely agree with that. Something that's coming up for me though, and I don't know if you guys even know, like, is that even legal? Did she have like the right to these photos? So she acquired them via a FOIA crest, uh, right, Tara? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, so she had to pay for them, too. So she paid for them, and then she's making other people pay her for them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely would agree with what you said before, Collier, where it's almost like a pick me or, like, look at me, like, I have all these things. Um, yeah, it definitely does not sit well with me. Um, Tara, what do you think? I don't think it sits well with me too. I think that, yeah. you know, people can do this by mistake and be like, what, what did I just do right now? Because everybody makes mistakes. I mean, this is a big mistake. Um, however, yeah. I think that it's really just, it makes me upset that she doesn't even see this as wrong. They both don't see this as wrong. Mm. So have they put out a statement? Oh, yes. What did they say? Essentially just like defending themselves? Let me see if I could pull up the statement. I also sent it to Collier. Well, I, Zav's girl said a statement. Yeah. And I think the, the, the thing that I find most disturbing is the fact that, that um, you know, again, this is a look they're acting without thinking because it's all about them. Like not only are they trying to make money, <laughs> right? And I think they, and I, a friend said, I believe, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, Tara, they made something like $19 or something. Like, like 18, $19, <laughs> which is ironic because 18 is the amount of times he actually got stabbed. Oh, wow. That's terrible. Um, and, and you think about, the sacrifice that they just made to do something that is so horrific. And I think that they doubled down if I'm not mistaken, Tara. And I know you did send this to me. I was trying to pull them up so our audience could see them, but uh, it's not working for some reason. So in the News Nation article, it says that Zav Girl has argued against this claim in a message saying that she posted on her channel on Tuesday. She said she was not selling the individual photos of Stotch um, Gannon, uh, but uploaded a full video only accessible by her Patreon followers. It was focused on the photos as well as the audio from the homicide trial. Patreon allows people to subscribe to individuals for a monthly fee. You know, it's that, you know, yeah. creator fee, but it's like, you have to pay for this. And she doesn't see this as unethical. And I think that that is a main problem today with true crime. And I'm really happy that people like Kendall Ray is getting behind this and also tweeting about this because it's so important to bring awareness to the unethical creation that people are doing right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, I, I again, and, and my 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 mind went to you, uh, what you said, Brenna, which was. <laughs> How is this, like, how is this um, even legal? <laughs> because it's a child, right? And I would imagine that there's got to be some sort of laws against exploitation 
So I would just, if I were them, I think I would maybe give pause to the fact that like, am I going to be arrested for doing this? <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. Is this going to be jail time for me if I do this? And I don't know where this stands on the legal spectrum. And uh, of course, I am not in law enforcement nor a lawyer or anything of that nature. But wondering if, in fact, they could get in massive criminal, have criminal char- char- charges filed against them. I think I- that thing that so many people, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I think that that's something that so many people, especially focusing on like the internet have struggled with where like they act and then think later where so many people have gotten themselves in such deep water because they just tweet what's on their mind or they post what they want to post. And then all of a sudden they get backlash and then they realize like, Oh, that actually wasn't super smart. Yeah. And I think that the thing is, is that this girl doubled down and defended herself. How old Um, did you know? The, the the girl the creator i i think 20s <laughs> no she looks so older than that to me oh. but i may be she's old she's older than 12 <laughs> she's old enough to know <laughs> she's old enough to know better that's all we know <laughs> yeah i was asking because like the frontal lobe which is like our decision making like doesn't fully uh-huh. form until we're 25 so i was like all right like maybe if she's like 20 21 22 like there could be like some sort of like reason, but also even people without fully frontal, fully formed frontal lobes can not do this. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting that you mentioned like the prefrontal cortex, like the prefrontal lobe. Um, It's also interesting that narcissists like have that area dimmed in their brain. Mm, Do they? I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Bubsy to you says allegedly Zav girl stream went completely wrong and she wasn't watching chat. And then she says that Zav girl is young and Natasha is in her late forties. Okay. Oh. Um so old enough to know better, for sure. Yeah. I'm hoping that at least for Zav Girl, this is something that she can look back on and 10 plus years and be like, damn, I was just like a stupid 20 year old and I really was not making good decisions. But it sounds like if the other person, Natasha, is in her 40s, that I don't know. Yeah, and it, obviously, obviously they can't create content anymore. I mean, I'm sure they're going to have their, um, I'm sure they're going to have a, um, you know, a lot of issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bubsy to you also says Natasha is a personal friend. Mm. Oh, wow. Can we hold her accountable and ask her to donate the money to the victim's family who might not be able to bury the body? Mm. That's an interesting, that's an interesting um, thing. Um, I wonder, you know, again, when you look back, and this is one of the things I, I tell a lot of young people when I talk to them is understanding the, the consequences of your actions, right? And I think nowadays, I think we look at a lot of people, um, a lot of people who are uh, out there creating content that perhaps do not think about the future. Uh, Jennifer Lewis Harris says that Zav Girl is in her 40s also. Oh, that changes apparently, that. So apparently both, both old enough to know better, for sure. Yeah. I, and I think the, the thing that, that is is most concerning is there was um, there was a podcast called The Murder Sheet that recently acquired about 120 documents regarding the um, the Delphi case in Indiana, and they apparently have done a very good job. I don't know the podcast, but apparently it's a lawyer and a and a journalist that are a part of this, or they're both lawyers or something to this effect, and they also have. I I I don't know why I, I I know that what they claim that they that they did this for was because there's been so many rumors surrounding that case and so much speculation on the internet. They did this to get the documents to expose them to the public. Be like, this is what the police are doing. Now let's put this to bed instead of coming up with all these crazy conspiracy theories. That's their claim, and and it apparently has has worked for that. Um, but these FOIA requests seem to be very very easy to get and also 
law enforcement sometimes turns over because they weren't supposed to turn over these photos. This was a mistake, and it was exploited by these creators, uh, apparently, according to law enforcement. So now to be able to, to, looking back, like, is that mean that there's going to be more rejections of these FOIA requests? Because a lot of times these families use these FOIA requests to get information for their own personal well-being to find out why they can get this. And, and I think law enforcement, I would imagine, would be a lot more judicious when handing these requests out. It's been so hard to get mine. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's just interesting, you know, that people could do this. But it's, you know, if people have accountability for what they've done, that's a different scenario. And I think all we're asking, too, is for creators to do better and to own up to this and see how it affects the survivors, the victims. Mm -hmm. And Tara, I think something that you speak a lot about um, that I had honestly never heard before you started speaking about it is ethical true crime. And I think that it's something that so many people should educate themselves about and really make decisions moving forward. Like, is this podcast that I'm going to listen to ethical true crime? Are these pictures that I'm about to look at ethical true crime? So that was super helpful for me. So thank you. Oh, thank you too. I don't think I, you know, th there's the, there's the fine line, right? I think that, that with, you know, and then sometimes Tara and I disagree with this. There is an entertainment factor to sharing true crime stories, right? Because obviously there is this voracious appetite in the public to, to talk about these kinds of stories, to hear these types of stories. And also there's a, there's a sort of, you know, there's a lot of people that find solace in knowing that people have gotten justice for their situations or have overcome an adversity, or also want to learn how to better take care of themselves and, and be aware, uh, you know, in their lo own lives. But on the flip side, then there's this exploitation, I think, these showing of these photos of a child, or showing, showing these photos in general, whether or not they're a child, and thinking about the injury that that might cause, mm -hmm. is is really really damaging and and for and to what end i always ask like what is to what end does this serve a purpose right is it about money is it about fame is it about reporting because there's reasons why the new york times didn't publish these <laughs> these photos there's reasons why usa today was in and these because these people have multi-million dollar legal departments they're like you can't do this <laughs> you, you know mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like for a lot of organizations like that, people just felt like it was too sticky. Yeah, and you know, it's just interesting because the journalists who are legit journalists too, don't want to feed into traumatizing the families again. They want to lean more towards the ethical side of true crime that I'm at least seeing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And it's, uh, somebody says here that Natasha will be doing a statement on her channel in a few hours. So here we are. Oh. And there will be statements about this. <laughs> well, sure. we will see. We shall see what's going on with all of this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, moving on to uh, some sort of entertainment and gossipy fun news. Uh, now, um, Brenda, did you watch The Idol on HBO? I did not, but Tara, again, shared with me so many different articles about it today. I had texted her back, I think verbatim, I said, my jaw is on the floor. <laughs> like, I don't even know where to start with that. Yeah, it is It is interesting for sure. You know, um, there was, uh, you know, obviously Selena Gomez, who is the ex of, um, the ex of The Weeknd, who who plays, what is this character's name, Tara? Tedros. Tedros, that's it. Uh, she saw some very eerie similarities as well in in this, and um, it's a it's it's caused a massive uproar. I mean, I have so many friends that were like, "This is the worst show I've ever seen." I I enjoyed it because I I'm a cinematographer, so I enjoyed the cinematography and the lighting. I was that's why I was enjoying it. The content was very hard to swallow. So. Again, I have not seen it, but just from the snippets that I read about it, it seems like The Weeknd created a show that was almost like 
exploitive by nature of Selena Gomez's life. And I think I have so many friends who are creatives, who work in film, who work in the arts and stuff. And I think that it is so awesome to use experiences that you have had and put that into art and make a film and stuff. But I don't think that's what he did. I think he used Selena's experiences and put that into a show without her consent. Yeah, I think that... <laughs> I think that's the gist of it. That's, I think, what we're sort of getting in this sort of trickle down. What do you think, Tara? I think it's also interesting because I heard rumors, we'll say rumors, about The weekend and saying that he is in this cultish lifestyle in real life. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems that there's eerie similarities to real life and the show. And it's at his house. It's just, you know, is it is it real life? Hmm. Is art imitating life is the question. <laughs> and again, I don't think there would be an issue if his art was imitating his life, but it seems like his art was really imitating Selena's life. Yes. And he was the total con artist. Like he planned for her to come to the club. So and to bring her to the club where he met her, he called her out on the dance floor, creating her to like, okay, I have to fawn and go be with this guy because he's calling out my name on the dance floor. And if I say no, I'm going to look bad to everyone. So that's already like a ploy in the, like the trauma bonding of it. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. What do you so? What do you know about trauma bonds, Brenna? Trauma bonds. Oh my goodness! I actually had one of Tara's good friends, Lacey, on to talk about trauma bonds, and I think Tara, we the three of us had done um, an Instagram live like a year or two ago about trauma bonds. So essentially, trauma bonds are just that: people that experience trauma together and then they are bonded. Um, it's it almost reminds me, and Tara, I'd love to hear what you think about this, but it reminds me of almost like an anxious attachment of like, I need to be with this person, almost like an obsessive nature. Do you agree with that? I do too, but we also discussed that there's two types of trauma bonds. You know, there's the one, like the seven stages where you talked about, and that's like the trauma bond with like the narcissist or the toxic abusive relationship in a sense. And then there's like the trauma bond, like Collier and I have with our trauma. Mm -hmm. But it's healthy, you know, it's not like that codependency, but, you know, at first we related to each other because we're like, oh, we've both been into this trauma and let's be friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. And one is definitely more healthy than the other. Yes, but there is that codependency that it can lead to if you are trauma bonded to this person. And I love to hear about, you know, the seven stages too for the narcissistic trauma bond. Mm, yes, I would have to go back in my notes to get those like spot on. Do you know them off the top of your head? Like in order? I'm um, uh, the first one's love bombing. Ah, uh, yes. I could talk about love bombing all day. Do you have any experience with that? So much. <laughs> uh, well, it's also because people tr uh, love bomb in different ways, too. Like a boss can love bomb you. And I know Collier's had experience with this as well, especially with <laughs> Collier's a good looking man. Um, you know, it's just a fact. And so women will love bomb him, say, with business and be like, oh, I have this project. You know, let's do work with this. And you know, tr you've been love bomb in other ways too. Yeah, I think it's been, uh, <laughs> there's been a few times with that. Um, but uh, uh, give us some good examples, um, Brenna, of, of love bombing. Ooh, so love bombing is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's just like an overwhelming amount of love very fast. So like a good example would be, you know, meeting someone, at dinner the night before and you had shared with them you maybe you really hit it off at dinner you went on a date and everything was good you shared with them that you 
are going to be in a play the next day. They show up at the play. They have flowers for you. They want to take you out. They want to celebrate you. It's just a lot very fast um, and almost like invasive to a sense. Like they really want to enmesh themselves like in that person's life. They want to be in every aspect of their life. Yes, like Tedros coming into Jocelyn's life where he was like, oh, I could give you this. Like, you're so in your head. Like, I could get you out of your head and I can get you the music that you want right now. Mm -hmm. And as we, I was just racking my brain about the seven stages, I do know that the second one is trust and dependency. So, Tara, I feel like you can talk about that because I feel like you have such experience with that with your mom and John. Can, uh, can I actually ask, because I know you do have to go, can you talk a little bit, you mentioned enmeshment. Can you talk Ooh. a little bit about that? Yeah, so enmeshment is essentially a therapy term. And when we become enmeshed with someone, our lives are very much like this. Like we become intertwined with them, but in an unhealthy way where there's some codependency feelings, there's an anxious attachment, there's maybe not a trauma bond, but a deep bond where there's almost high expectations where there shouldn't be. Um, so when we become enmeshed, it's just very unhealthy. Yeah, and Tara, you know, you saw that obviously go on, happen with your, your, with your mother. Oh yeah, John wanted to get involved in the finances, the business, he's like, oh, I'm a business man, man I could get involved. Someone who wants to become enmeshed in a romantic partner or even like their family, you're so right, Tara. They want to be involved in every single aspect. And there's almost anger or rage if they find that they're not involved in every aspect of their life. Like Tedros. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, this is something, and I'm glad that you're on, Brenna, because this is something that I've, I've been unpacking for the last several years. And Tara and I have talked about it a lot offline. Um, where, where I, I've had these types of individuals in my life. And of course, I feel like I'm drawn to them or I accept their behavior might be, I'm not drawn to them necessarily. I accept their behavior because of the behavior of my father growing up. Mm. And therefore it's, in, so it's sort of like, um, you know, putting on an old t-shirt that feels really comfortable <laughs> or, or you can settle into it and go, okay, well, I've, I've, I've dealt with this before so I can handle this now, even though it feels icky, right? Mm. Something I say a lot in, in sessions with clients is I heard you say the word comfortable, like it feels really comfortable. And I think a lot of the times we use the word comfortable when we really mean familiar. Like it sounds like being enmeshed with someone feels so familiar to you, but it sounds like it doesn't really feel comfortable for you. It sounds like you know this is not good. That's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Terry, you witnessed this happen. What was, uh, what was, what was sort of the, how, how quickly did John get involved? So quickly, I think within a matter of like a month or weeks, I wasn't living in California, but when I came to see them, see my mom and meet him and whatnot, they were together for two months. And that was when he moved in, which it's funny. My mom just has this thing where, you know, they move in quickly and whatnot, but it's just like he was there and he was moved in. He was enmeshed. Enmeshed. Mm -hmm. uh, Forever Curious has shared, uh, it, w the first is love bombing. Second is trust and dependency. Third is criticism. Fourth is gaslighting. Five is resignation. Sixth is loss of self. And seven is addiction. That number seven will really get you because I share with people all the time, like the, the real danger, honestly, of getting into a relationship like this is that the way your brain forms when you're in this, it does become addictive because then in the future, when you get out of something like this and you hopefully enter a healthy relationship, we can almost think that it feels boring. We can think that there's something wrong because there's no spark. When in reality, Healthy love is boring sometimes. <laughs> uh, that is, that's a, because, and is that because these people take you on this roller coaster ride of the ups and downs? 
Mm -hmm. And the way that our brain forms, our brain connects those up and downs to love. You know, we, our brain almost gets high on the fact of like, are they going to text me? Are we going to make up from this fight? Are we going to passionately, passionately make up? Like, is this going to be great? When am I going to get that text? When are they going to come see me? That when we have consistency in the future, it doesn't feel fun. But you're saying that addiction is that on that's on the the side of the person who is in, in the relationship who isn't the narcissist, correct? Correct. So what is it that the narcissist feels, or do they just not feel anything? I would assume that they just feel nothing, like they just keep doing this. Um, a true narcissist would keep doing this, like someone with narcissistic personality disorder would just kind of discard this partner and move on to a next one, where then that partner has all of this trauma to really heal from. Do you feel like they kind of crave the highs and the lows at times? Because I feel like, especially with my relationship with narcissist, I've literally had thrown fits with them and been like, you won't see me, you won't do this and that. Do you think they crave that in a sense? I would say, and this is totally my opinion, so I would not say this as a fact, but I would say that instead of a narcissist craving like a high and a low, where a healthier person does crave that high and low, the narcissist just craves like being in control and kind of having the upper hand. Ooh. So Tara, you saying that like in past relationships or past experiences with narcissists, you've said like, I'm leaving that probably triggered that person because they don't, they feel like you have the upper hand if you're calling the shots. And it's triggered them to say like, oh, I love you or I could do better. Or, I have another person lined up here and there. It's like, it's a weird effect. It's like, it either gets them to say like, I love you or it gets them to like, be like, well, I have more girls. So <laughs> go. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I think depending on who the partner is or who the person is that the narcissist is, interacting with whatever will gain them more control if it's saying oh i have another partner and they know that their current partner is going to beg for them to come back they'll do that or if they think oh this person is you know actually going to leave me they'll discard that person and just get someone else yeah i uh yeah, I think the I think the highs and the lows, the the being the being lifted up and then dropped down. I mean, that's always what I have experienced, and um, and it was very familiar <laughs> familiar behavior of of my upbringing. And I think that mm. that's that's the thing. Um, you know, well, I I you know I, I I don't feel like I don't talk enough about this on my channel sometimes. Uh, so I'm so grateful to have you, uh, Brenna. You have to get going, correct? I do, but if you ever want to have a conversation about what you went through or just talk about mental health in general, I'm here. That would be wonderful. This uh, Now, uh, please tell our audience where they can find you, Brenna. Yeah, so I am on Instagram. The handle is real.fckn.talk. Um, I am wherever you listen to podcasts with the same name. Um, and yeah, I think I'm on TikTok with that name too, but I don't think I've ever posted, so... I just I'm want gonna, I'm going to put your uh your handle here real f c k n talk. Yes, with dots in between each each word like periods. real dot <laughs> real dot f c and I'm also doing this without my glasses. Oh. <laughs> on Instagram. Yes. Uh Brenna Ty, thank Brenna. you so much for of joining course. the program. It has been a real pleasure. Uh, and we look forward to having you back on here. Yes, of course. It was a pleasure to come, Tara. I'm so happy we caught up. And Collier, it was so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Have a great day. Yes, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara, for, for bringing her to the program. Of course. I'm so happy I just connected with her over those text messages. It was funny, too, because she thought I had a different opinion. And then I sent her a voice message and I was like, no, I, I think this is coercive control. I think he's using therapy language. And so that got the ball rolling. Yeah, the use of the therapy language for sure. Um, 
So tomorrow is Thursday. And what usually happens on Thursdays, Tara? We have a Survivor Squad episode with Amanda Knox. Yes, we have Amanda Knox, who's going to be on the program. And she's quite a controversial figure in a lot of people's minds. Um, but I feel, uh, what did you think about our conversation with her? I thought it was really interesting because you don't know how much a trauma affects someone. And yeah. then if you get convicted and you're living in a different country, there's a language barrier. There's all of that. It's it's crazy to me. And she's a sweet little girl in a sense. And she's just like, okay, yeah, like, what do I do to get out of this? And then she signs something and her life is over in a sense. Yeah, she um it was really it was really difficult to hear her, hear her parts of her story and I, I you know I had watched the documentary beforehand um which I believe was called This is Amanda Knox or I am Amanda Knox maybe uh and then you obviously had read her book and you know as someone who is a filmmaker and I'm watching the sh the, the film I'm like oh and there's some great parts it was shot really well they did a fantastic job but uh, I was, I was shocked and not that I was really paying attention to it to begin with. It just wasn't, I, I just knew about it, but I was shocked at how little of the actual real details I knew because they made her out to be something that she was clearly not. Um, and it just became this, this vicious media frenzy and obviously getting into the world of true crime later we're making my film and, and being out there, I just my heart just really went out to your to her. What do you, what was your initial what, what what were you thinking? I was just thinking that I could relate to her on a level, but I can't relate to what she's been through. I just can only relate to the media <laughs> uh, aftermath. Yeah, the media kerfuffle, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> but she's got it like. 10 times worse than I've ever gotten it. Yeah. And she was in prison for four years. Yeah. So, I mean, she's been through a lot and I just want her to live a life of peace now. Yeah, absolutely. And she's got her, uh, and she's got her, uh, her podcast labyrinths with her husband. So anyways, tomorrow we will have her on our survivor squad podcast and, uh, Tara, do you have anything else to say to our audience? Um, I just got to say like a few more things that Larry Nassar, that guy, he was stabbed the other day. So um, kudos to the person who did that. <laughs> <laughs> We're not promoting violence. We're not promoting violence here. If you guys don't know who Larry Nassar is, he was the doctor, I believe, at Michigan State University who had, um, had assaulted hundreds of young um, women under the guise of giving them physicals and things of that nature. Something very similar to what my father had done uh, before he committed the ultimate act against my mother. Um, but uh, yeah, he was attacked in prison and I don't know. I think he's just in an infirmary at the moment. I think he has managed to survive, but I, I read that he was, he was stabbed like 10 or 12 times. Like it's a lot. Yeah. That's it's, a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm well, not trying to promote violence now. No, no, we're not trying to promote <laughs> violence on this on this on this YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> well, Tara, thank you so much for joining. Uh, where can they find Survivor Squad? They can find Survivor Squad where anywhere where podcasts are available. We also have a YouTube page. We have an Instagram. We have a Twitter, a Facebook page, and a Patreon is the most important one where you can get exclusive content. Thank you so much, Tara. It's so great to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I, I want to say thank you to both my guests. Uh, this was a little impromptu, impromptu session. There's a lot going on, and I wanted to share some differing opinions and some uh, cogent analysis outside of myself for you guys. Uh, I want to say thank you all so much. I have been um, uh, something I'm sharing with my private YouTube members here in the next uh, day is I am. Um, I unearthed a recording recently, uh, earlier this week, um, I had reached out to my aunt who is on my father's side and, uh, we, we talk sometimes we've, we've been getting to know each one another once again, and she had sent me this a while ago and I must've missed it, but my father was on a podcast 
a few years back um, because he was trying to overturn his conviction and saying that he was improperly sentenced. Anyways, he he goes on this diatribe for about 16 minutes and it is uh, it is very interesting. So I'll be doing a follow-up episode with that, but I'll, I will make that available on both my Patreon and my YouTube members section for you guys to check out for all my YouTube channel members. And um, it just sort of my initial sort of me reacting to it, to this uh, just insane, insane diatribe that he goes on. But of course, it's interesting. Uh, he uh, first attacks me and my... Um, me as a child witness and saying things of uh, that I had not been able to properly, that I was coached by law enforcement, that I was co coached by the prosecution, and therefore that was something that I was, um, you know, uh, that I should be held accountable for and my testimony should be thrown out. It was actually just kind of very, very loony. And I, and I, like I said, I do remember reading this in the paper that he was trying to file this and that. And um, it's interesting, but I'll have that in the member section for you guys uh, very soon. And uh, I want to say thank you so much to all my YouTube channel members, all my YouTube channel subscribers, all my Patreon supporters, and all of you who have tuned in today for today's live episode of Moving Past Trauma. Um, you guys are the reason why I do all this and I try to get more and more great guests. Uh, I In about two weeks, I'm going to have on... Uh, there is a new podcast which is brought, being brought out by the case file podcast which is just, which is covering um the, the in the 90s there was a very famous uh hollywood nightclub called dragonfly and the owner of that brett cantor uh his life was taken uh, very mysteriously and it's become a cold case and now there is renewed interest in that cold case so i'm going to have on two of the detectives that are working on that case they're going to share that with me uh in about two weeks from today i believe i, I believe it's july 26 they're going to be on the program and uh, we're going to share this. Uh, they are doing this new podcast about this with the Case File podcast series. If you guys are familiar with them, pretty big podcast. And uh, it's going to be great. So we're going to have on the producer and both of the detectives that have been working on the cold case. So that'll be really fascinating for you guys. And um, yeah, uh, I just really appreciate the support. Um, everyone who supports me, all you guys commenting in the links below. And um, yeah, I really, I really appreciate everything. So on that note, Mover Nation. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Trauma. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright Collier Landry.